religious experience. This presentation is in two parts. The first part focuses on the nature of religious experience and the second part focuses on using it as a proof of God's existence. Religious experience, by definition, could be considered an experience of some ultimate reality or a divine being we call God. This would be an all-powerful, perhaps an ineffable being. Ineffability is a term we're going to come across shortly, but it means that you can't really put and articulate into words um, the being itself or the experience. Well, religious experience can be divided into two different categories. The first are direct experiences, so contact with God directly or with an ultimate reality. A great example of this is found in the New Testament for Christians, where you've got the conversion of who was once called Saul, uh, the Jewish persecutor of Christians, who changed his name as well as his faith to Paul in Christianity. Another good example of this would be the revelation of the Quran to the prophet Muhammad, a direct encounter with God. Then you would have the second category, which is indirect. So this is when you have an internal sense of something other than this world, something which sits outside of this world. One example could be the mystical experiences of St. Teresa of Avila, where she felt the presence of God. St. Teresa, in particular, um, is a useful example of indirect religious experiences. She was, um, had a very troubled childhood growing up. Um, she eventually ended up going to a convent um, at the request of her father. And the difficulty that she found in focusing on prayer um, became a hallmark of her life in the convent uh, and eventually gave up prayer at one point, especially when she grew sick with malaria. Um, however, she made a return um, at the request of priests uh, and others. Um, she wasn't taken seriously by all people. Some thought she had a devil inside of her. Um, but she was famous for some of the experiences that she had and wrote about. In particular, she wrote about her journey with prayer. And there's one miracle that's referred to as the ecstasy of St. Teresa. So she this Spanish um, reformer, she had this vision, like many, of a transverberation that pierced her heart with the fiery arrow of divine love. And she talks about her relationship with God in this kind of way. Her mystical experiences were not about direct revelation necessarily um, with God, but a lot of it was what she felt within. And so let's turn to types of religious experience. There's not one definition, but many, and they all sit under the umbrella term religious experience. Some types could be the corporate religious experience. So for example, um, experiences which are for a group of people. And it's worth pointing out that for this exam, we should be thinking about lots of examples of um, religious experiences in order to write about. So the corporate experiences of a group of people, one example of this could be the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, also used to be called the Toronto Vineyard Church in Canada. Um, this church, where I myself have visited in the past, in 1994 onwards became a global phenomena for Christians who traveled all around the world, thousands of them went there, to experience what was only coined really as a renewal of God's love on the Christian church. People were laughing, crying, falling, shaking, being healed, it was claimed, of many things. And people shared the same manifestations of the Holy Spirit uh, as it was believed at the time, and it still goes today. Prayer is another uh, religious experience. Prayer is divine communication between humanity and God. During prayer, prayers being answered, all these kind of things. 
conversion religious experiences. There's a range of different types of conversions. So you could have an intellectual conversion experience like John Henry Newman, who was the English Anglican Church of England priest, um, who later converted to the Roman Catholic Church. You've also got moral conversions, like the fairly well-known story of Swearing Tom, who swore profusely until he became a Christian, and then instantly the swearing stopped. You have religious conversions, like the one I've mentioned before as well, Saul to Paul um, on the Damascus Road. Meditation. Think about um, the Buddha, Prince Siddhartha Gautama, who sat under the Bodhi tree and meditated for a long time and out of that had a religious experience. You have the numinous. This is the um, feeling of something holy or something other than so you or something beautiful that might move you. So you could walk into a space, could be a church, a mosque or a, a religious sacred space of some kind, it doesn't have to be religious, and you might have that indwelling feeling of something which is outside of this world hitting you. Um, it could simply be looking at a beautiful field uh, and being awestruck. Then there are visions. Visions can be open or closed. So you can have a vision with your eyes wide open uh, and you can see something. Maybe it's a vision of Jesus uh, or a vision of Mary, as often has been in the Catholic Church. A closed vision would be when you are awake, but your eyes are closed, then you're seeing something in your mind's eye. There's dreams as well, which obviously are when you're asleep, um, and voices, people claiming to have heard the audible or the internal voice of God. So some believe there's an external sound outside of them, and others believe that it's within them, a small, still, quiet voice. There's also propositional and non-propositional revelation. So when you have propositional revelation, you are experiencing something where you're revealing a truth directly from God, about God. Non-propositional revelation doesn't really often entail facts that are revealed to you, but it's rather God making himself known. So examples of this of propositional revelation could be uh, any of the prophets so you could take a prophet like Isaiah there in the Old Testament of the Bible and he received like many of the prophets did direct truth from God about God that he then shared with others you also have an example of non-propositional revelation so the Buddha who meditated and reached enlightenment. We've already mentioned him. Now, he didn't necessarily get a direct download of truth about a god, because Buddhists typically don't follow and worship a god. But he, through meditation and that enlightenment experience of nirvana, he was able to share um, advice to people and philosophy to people uh, from a non-factual based experience. John Hick. Hick became a Christian himself when he was younger and it came from a strong religious experience that he had and the ideas began with his first work Faith and Knowledge. Now he argued that Christianity was best understood not by propositional revelation but by non-propositional revelation. And that's because he said that individuals experiencing the world were also experiencing the religious. So you might have that numinous experience. That's not propositional. That's non-propositional. We then turn to William James and his features of a mystical experience. It's worth pointing out here that Mystical experience is a sort of modern term or another term given to um, religious experience. It's often used interchangeably. And it was William James who probably first coined the term religious experience and used it 
in scholarship. Mysticism would be looking at some of the saints, such as uh, Teresa of Avila that we mentioned earlier, uh, or Saint Bernadette and others in the Catholic Church. We might refer to them as mystics, or Saint Francis of Assisi is another one. Um, they practiced the art of mysticism. They uh, devoted their lives and sought out a connection with the divine, with God. Mystical experiences are really um, a broad term, but a religious experience is in the framework of religion per se. Many mystics become, they believe they become one with the divine, one with God. So having cleared that up, a 19th century theologian is William James, and he developed four terms uh, that were features of a mystical experience. So the first is ineffability. We've already mentioned this. Uh, the nature of an experience which goes beyond our human words and language. Then he mentioned noeticism, noetic quality. And that is being beyond the knowledge of normality and actually receiving knowledge um, about the world, the universe, about spirituality from a higher place. Transiency is a short-lived nature of the experience. Um, so the religious experience often will come and then go. I suppose for James, what was particularly of interest is whether or not the experience had a lasting impact and made a change in the person, even though the experience itself had moved on. And finally, passivity. This is when the experience that you have comes from the outside to the individual and has an impact on them. It's not necessarily something that you were then actively seeking and looking for always. Or not nothing that you can make happen yourself as such. We then turn to Rudolf Otto. He was a Christian Protestant theologian who examined the nature of religious experience. And he came up with the following terms. Mysterium. He wrote in his book, The Holy. Mysterium. The mystery of a religious experience. Tremendum, which is the sense of awe at the religious experience. And fashions, fascination with the divine. And there's somewhat of a process in this, that the experience has a mystery to it. And it leads to a sense of awe about it. And then it can go on to being a fascination with the divine. It could be then a further increased faith in God. Let's turn to Peter Vardy. And he argues that people's presuppositions about religion will affect how they interpret events. So what they already believe about religion or their upbringing or their beliefs will, it, will warp what they think about the religious experience. So if they believe in God already, they're more likely to accept the experience as being a religious experience from God. And this raises a question at this point, which is whether or not the religious experiences that one has are subjective or objective. Can they be objective experiences where it's factual, there's no real bias, um, or are they subjective, where it's very much relative and dependent on your interpretation of these events? There are some alternative explanations about religious experiences. So they could arise from a social um, rather than religious factor. So you might refer to group hysteria, uh, like the Toronto uh, church that I mentioned earlier with the corporate religious experience. You might argue that that is a form of hysteria during religious worship that people coming together doing this emotional um, thing in a service where the music is playing and 
There might be somebody praying at the front or talking softly, and that could lead to, or someone speaking loud and fast, could lead to a form of group hysteria. Others might point towards the fact that they take the form of religions that they already are familiar with. So in other words, their upbringing could be an explanation for why they've had this experience. Sigmund Freud, the famous psychologist, offered a psychological explanation. And he called religion, in not so friendly terms, a neurosis, um, effectively arguing that you're having a mental episode. It's a form of mental illness or derangement. And therefore, religion and God are a creation of your mind. And it's not something you can claim to be objectively true. You might go as far as to say that someone's religious experience is simply an hallucination. Well, let's move to the second part of this topic, which is using religious experience as a proof, considering those types and those features and those examples with a couple of those question marks around objective subjective distinction there, um, or whether it's something uh, that can be considered uh, real um, as happening, or whether it's a hallucination of the mind. Using religious experience as an argument to prove the existence of God falls in the category of being an inductive proof. It's using inductive reasoning. And so it's an argument of induction. If I experience God through induction, then like with other inductive experiences that I have, I can generally conclude that God exists. And so a classic inductive proof of Religious experience can be set out like this. Premise one, experience of X, whatever that is, indicates that X exists. Premise two, God can be experienced. And so premise three, experience of God indicates that God then exists. In conclusion, God exists. Now, a strength of this inductive reasoning could be that it leads clearly here to uh, at least the probability that God might exist. However, there are some issues with using it as an actual proof of God's existence in, in its entirety. Brian Davies on inductive arguments, in specifically this one, gives four reasons to reject the inductive argument for religious experience. Firstly, he says that your experiences can be deceptive. So you can't rely on the first premise that this experience leads to this point. Two, psychosocial pressures can influence your experience and your interpretation of that experience. So similar to what we mentioned before, social um, and upbringing. There's no way, he says, of verifying the truth of the experience. That would link us nicely to another topic, which I will share on religious language, the verification principle. And fourthly, accounts of religious experience vary hugely. And so you might have no consistency with what's being said about the experience and also the teaching that might follow from that experience. There are four counter replies to Brian Davies' ideas here. You might be able to say that not all experiences are deceptive, especially when you look at the amount of experiences across the world over the centuries that people have claimed to have had. Secondly, you might say uh, that psychosocial pressures are not always involved. Um, it may not be the case that you can really link anything back. There are some methods of verification. It wouldn't be true to say that there is no way whatsoever of verifying anything. And finally, you can agree that something exists without agreeing about its nature. So even though multiple religious experiences may differ, at least they can all agree that there is something out there, something greater than themselves. It's not just an inductive argument, religious experience, but it's also a cumulative 
argument. This is something Swinburne likes to talk about. So something that is cumulative increases in quantity or force by successive additions. You can see here in this cumulative chart how it goes up. Proponents of the cumulative argument say that the number of people who claim to have had a religious experience has accumulated to such an extent that it becomes highly probable that religious experiences are real and that many people could not have simply just been dismissed for being mistaken or for lying in all cases. Of course, it would be acceptable to say that some might be mistaken or some might be lying at different times, but to argue that all of them over the centuries have been mistaken or lying would be quite a claim. Swinburne uses the cumulative argument and applies it to all of the arguments that we would look at. So you can click on the design argument and you can click on the cosmological argument and the ontological argument to study those proofs of God's existence and use it and compound it with religious experience. And then you have a cumulative argument. So weighing up the evidence, it seems likely here that God exists. The weight of testimony of people's stories is in believers' favour, in those who believe in God. The problem, however, with this argument is that, unlike the inductive argument, it's not seeking to prove that God exists. Swinburne uses the cumulative argument to prove the existence of God, but in and of itself, the argument is not like an inductive argument. It's not concluding that there is a God. It's just showing you that it is likely that there is a God. Now, this has led people to argue that while a religious experience may not have any proof attached to it, because of the weight of this cumulative argument, it becomes probable. And that leads to a, a great debate about probability versus proof in philosophy. It is actually one of the reasons that Richard Swinburne in the cosmological argument came up with a modern version of it and claimed that it should be really an inductive argument, not a deductive argument, because it's better to come to the conclusion that God probably exists from what we observe in the universe uh, rather than claiming he, you can totally prove his existence from what you see. Well, let's turn to Richard Dawkins. Dawkins argues that the symptoms of religious experience and psychosis are remarkably similar. A little bit like Freud here, he doesn't pull his punches. And that leads him to believe that this is an explanation for the phenomena of religious experience. And it does not, therefore, lead to an argument for the existence of God. And he goes on to say that those experiencing a religious experience, very much like Freud argued, are suffering from psychosis and, not uncommonly, he says, are found on psychiatric wards. Another scientist who took, uh, who takes rather a less militant atheist approach to these things is Dr. Michael Persinger. He's a Canadian neuroscientist, and he argued that religious experience is not a phenomena that can be explained by things outside of your body. But in fact, if you go looking inside your body, you can find perhaps the mechanism that has led to it. So the source of religious experience is not from outside, but from within the brain. And more specifically, Persinger talks about highlighting the temporal lobe. It's worth pointing out here that for Persinger, he created the God Helmet exercise. And in this experiment, he, he used the helmet to stimulate the temporal lobes of the brain. And the idea of this was to study religious experience and creativity. He had many of his um, participants sense a presence when wearing this God helmet. Many of them actually referred to their experience as a mystical experience. 
And so by doing this, Persinger has made a connection with religious experiences and the brain. He argues that supernatural experiences are perceived to be from God, but can in fact simply be explained by the brain. As a counter to this, Dr. Ramachandran, the Indian-American neuroscientist, analysed his own case studies of patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. And he discovered, and there's a documentary on this, and he discovered that they often had similar experiences to people who claim religious experience. Many of his patients claimed to have a religious experience during an epileptic episode. Now, he doesn't dismiss God in his conclusions. Ramachandran offers an explanation uh, and says that he's open to the idea that maybe the temporal lobes are a way of communicating with the divine. Perhaps God, if there is a God who created us, put the temporal lobes there as a way of communicating with us. Richard Swinburne developed two principles and he believed that these give weight to the likelihood that religious experience are just as people claim that they are. He offers the principle of testimony. So this is in reference to people telling you their story, their testimony. And he argues that unless there's any evidence against that claim, we should believe the testimony of these individuals. He also offers up the principle of credulity. This is that for you personally, if you've had a religious experience, that unless there's any evidence against the claim that you've made, then we should probably believe the things as they are appearing to be to us. The critics would question, however, that things are not always as they seem. What about hallucinations? Making a reference back here to Freud and perhaps even Dawkins. Swinburne wants us to not instantly assume people who have had a religious experience are lying or misunderstood what they saw. He prefers us to take a more, what he believes to be a fairer approach. We shouldn't automatically be sceptical and dismiss these people's claims. But is this a strong argument for the existence of God? That is something you will need to evaluate. Finally, Peter Vardy, he's a British theologian, um, often works with A-level students in schools, uh, producing uh, material for students to study philosophy of religion. He argues that we need to question Swinburne's principles of testimony and credulity. He believes that religious experiences have a low probability of being true. And he compares it to having seen UFOs or a Loch Ness monster. That these experiences can become so far-fetched that they go unchallenged. He believes that they need to be challenged with investigation to determine whether or not they're true. And so, therefore, he encourages a more sceptical approach, which would very much be the opposite of what Swinburne is arguing. Swinburne is arguing to hold your horses on the scepticism. But Vardy says this should be encouraged. He also argues that people's views on religious experience are going to be influenced by their presuppositions. So they'll interpret a religious experience based on how they were raised or the religion of which they were raised with. So they'll see it through the lens of that. And he questions, therefore, whether these become subjective or objective claims, therefore. And he poses this question, which we will finish with. Can the experience be true, but the interpretation subjective? I'll leave that one for you to figure out.